My name is Rich Carney. I'm the Executive Director for ABBA, Austin Bridge Builders Alliance, and we're here today uh, talking to community leaders, uh, faith leaders, about um, how we're responding and uh, to this crisis where, uh, that we're faced ourselves in this pandemic. Today, I'm with a great friend of mine, Eric Heyman. He's the CEO of Austin Asset. And uh, so, Eric, I want to get right into this and ask you a question. How are you responding in the midst of all of this? Well, how do you stay open? as a business executive with, uh, with all this surrounding us. So, uh, thanks for having me, Rich. I, you know, I, I think this, um, it's been hard. I think there's a, there's a role of a leader that you feel very alone. Um, and at times you can feel even more isolated now because you can't have lunches with friends or go get a hug from somebody that you really care about. And so I think that the first step for me is just identifying that just the fact that that the elephant in the room is that it's, it's kind of, it's kind of um, scary to be alone when you, when as a leader, you're pretty connected to people. And so for now, I think the how we're dealing with this is our, in our business is, you know, fortunately, we're a very mobile business. We all have laptops. Uh, we have a wonderful office, but we have plenty of the technology and IT people to make it so that the continuity of the business is really clear. And we've been using Zoom calls or go to meetings with clients and things for a long time. And so we're just down doing more of that. Uh, so today I'm in the office. There's uh, four of us in the office today. We are all spread out so we can kind of come in oh. doing shifts, I guess, skeleton crew one day or the other um, to get out of our houses and get away from the dogs and kids uh, <laughs> to let it make it feel like we're at least are doing uh, productive work. And so um, I think the, the thing that I'm doing a lot more of than I probably was realizing is I'm having to be a lot more deliberate about having conversations that matter with people yeah. because it's not as natural to have a lunch or a breakfast um, or even a dinner um, with friends or people that you um, can bounce ideas off of. Right. And so I think I, I found myself texting a lot of mentors or having calls with mentors. Uh, whereas I'd normally be able to have those conversations live um, more kind of in a more flexible format. So I think, so for us as a business, we're certainly still open uh, we're able to forward our phone call, our, our um, phones here at the office to our cell phones. Uh, and then some of us are coming into the office just to take care of things, just to get away from our houses to, to kind of keep our sanity. So, you know, I think that's, that's true. Uh, you talk about keeping your sanity. You know, you, you want, you just, you take, you, sometimes you take it for granted. Work is a, a, a healthy place to be, you know, and you, you want to be there. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, what, yeah. Well, I think that the thing that, um, I mean, I've worked from home different days of the week, and many of us in the office have done that um, on occasion. I think that the difference now is the lines really being blurred around where the boundary is, um, mm -hmm. work and in and, and your life, the rest of your life. And I think that's the part that's been the hardest, I think, for us as a business even. Uh, and certainly for me is this idea of where does work in and where does the rest of my life start? Yeah. So the, the, the behavioral aspects of, getting up, having a coffee, if you drink coffee, or getting your breakfast the way you do, or going for a run, or having quiet time, or getting a shower. These normal behaviors, once they start changing, the lines get so blurred that you might find yourself at 10 o'clock in your bed on your laptop answering emails when you would have never done that before. <laughs> yeah, I could, I, I've already done that once or twice. And I think that's I think that's the part of it that's that's kind of um, it's a very slippery slope. I think we could we could get lost in um, trying to respond to have more control right now through those actions when we lose control of the rest of our of who we are, because we're so focused on trying to respond to a client or respond to a an issue via email, which we would have never been on our phone or on our laptop at ten o'clock at night before, but now we are. It's, think, it's, it, that's, there's, that's, there's, that's, there, there's no division, it seems like. Yeah, yeah I, think, I agree. Yeah. So I think that's the normal. Thing that, yeah, I think that's the thing that I've become more aware of just in the last week. Um, in working from home the last, well, I guess four days last week, was this idea of how do you maintain some normal routine to tell you when to turn off of work and when to turn it on? You know, yeah. how much, just go, you know, make yourself a lunch, get away from your laptop, um, you know, put your phone down. Um, because normally I would have gone out for a lunch with a friend or, you know, likely have yeah. lunch outside of my office. And so if, so there's things like that, that I'm becoming more aware of that I hadn't paid attention to before because the routine of a day had different structure to it, where it kind of had some built in boundaries. You got in your car, you drove home. So you turned off at work and you got home and you didn't open your laptop again. Well, now 
you're in your office and you go out to the kitchen, you have dinner with your family, and you, what do you do? You walk back into your you know office, you start answering mm-hmm. emails again. And so I think that's that's the that's the part that I think for our our mental health and emotional health that I've become more aware of is this idea of what can I be doing that makes it feel like it used to when I was getting in a car and driving to the office or going to meetings yeah. with uh, mentors or friends. So that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, which brings up a question, how do you communicate with clarity, both to your staff, clients, and others, when there's so many mixed messages we're getting from government and other entities? I, <laughs> yeah, that's a, uh, that's a really hard thing. I think the where, where the tension is for me is it's I want to communicate with clarity with the things that I that I feel like I mostly know. Well, right now, a lot of this isn't known by anyone. And I think um, and I'm going to say this carefully, but in, in just in our industry, there are plenty of people that say they want to know what's going to happen tomorrow with the investment markets, whether it's bonds, stocks or whatever is going to happen. The reality is no one knows. I mean, and the person that says they know what's going to be happening tomorrow, they might be making an educated guess. Um, and so I think right now the tension is around how do you create clarity about the things that you feel secure about? Mm. And then don't, and don't uh, pretend that you actually have an answer to something that you don't. And so I think that's the temptation right now is to want to create certainty when there isn't certainty. Right. I tiptoe into this world of being a little over your skis or a little bit out of your bounds. And you try and talk about things that you really don't know about to provide clarity, which you think will help people. But I think that's as a leader, it's, it's okay to say, I don't know. I mean, I think that mm-hmm. those words right now, I think build a lot more trust and respect than acting like you have an answer to something that you don't. And so right now I'm trying to be clear with our employees about what it means to what we're dealing with each day. Um, you know, here's what we're trying to solve today. Um, and with my family, I mean, I have, I have four kids, um, certainly a wife and four kids. And so the, the, how do I be clear as a leader of that house when I don't have all the answers? And so we're having plenty of discussions around what my, my kids may think that I know a lot more than I do mm-hmm. for me to say, I don't, I really, I don't know if it's okay for you to see a friend or not. And, and so, so in the wake of not knowing, we're not going to do it. Well, that, that can open up a complete firestorm. To a teenage boy who has a new girlfriend. I mean, like, <laughs> he wants yeah. to see his new girlfriend and go to the movies or whatever, or wants to get go to go to you know Waterburger and get a burger with his friends. And so I think there's, I think it's okay to say I don't know. I think that the the message of clarity right now, um, at least for me, is being okay saying I don't know. Okay. Talking about what I do feel like I do know, and that be that's probably more limited than than I would have done maybe if I was more, if I was younger. I think I'm, I'm more comfortable now saying, I just don't know. I mean, let's, here's what I think we can um, change about the situation and where we can have some ownership of it, what we can control. So as a, as a point, right? So um, there are plenty of businesses that are completely shut their doors. Mm-hmm. And people that have lost their jobs and there are people that are in positions where they don't know really if they're going to have the same role or same responsibility at their employer that they had before all this started. So I can talk to our employees about, here's what I do know about the situation we're in. We have margin, um, no one's losing their jobs. I can say those statements to hopefully give some reassurance, but it would be foolish for me to say that no one is gonna lose their jobs no matter what happens. Right. True, I don't, I don't know, because I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I don't know what the next week or two or months is going to bring. And so I don't want to give false hope, I guess, um, in terms of clear in a way that's not actually authentic. So, so that kind of goes to the, my next question about how do you make decisions <laughs> when, uh, when so many rapid different um, flow of uh, not just information, but the, the situation changes. Uh, how are you making decisions? And I think you've kind of partially answered that. It's one step at a time. Is there anything else you'd like to elaborate on that? I think the, the, the need for wise counsel mm. is really important. So I've, like I mentioned before, I've, I found myself maybe prepared to make a decision, but I just want to get one more take on it. Mm-hmm. It's a, a peer group or a mentor or someone in the industry that I can ask the question of. Um, I'm really, I really valuable wise counsel right now. Uh, from people that I have, um, <clears throat> 
industry with that know me and know the way I'm wired, they can look at the decision and go, you know, Eric, I think that aligns with how I know you, or that doesn't, mm -hmm. or there's misalignment. Like there's too much fear in that. Like you're reacting. Um, and so that, you know, certainly starts with my spouse. It starts with, you know, close friends I have, mentors, people that know the area of expertise that I'm trying to discuss. And so right now, my study groups are really valuable to me. My men's groups really valuable to me. My wife is really, I mean, these are all people that I have a lot of goodwill with, right. who I am as a person and that can look at that, the decision I'm considering and go, yeah, I don't know why you're thinking about it that way. That sounds like it's too much fear or it sounds like you're actually being too confident. Like I, I actually want to pull back from that a little bit and consider this other, this blind spot. So, that, that's excellent. It's, you know, there's so, scripture that talks about that two are better than one. Yep. And, right. I, and, uh, uh, that it's so essential at a time when it's, un, you know, you know that I'm retired uh, from the military and anytime I've been in these, um, situations, uh, uh, in combat, whatever, uh, you do, you know, you have, a, you have a mission to accomplish, but at the same time, it's the men and women to your left and right you depend on. And, and that's what I'm hearing here. It, it that hasn't changed. You're dependent on wisdom from, uh, from your, uh, your circles. So, yeah. so amen. Yeah. So do you see, uh, as we're moving forward, are there any opportunities out there uh, for our community to consider at this time? I think, well, the, there, are, there are a lot of hurting people. So mm -hmm. opportunities, I think there's a real chance to, to, to assess your situation and, and, and look at the posture you're in. And so the, I think the posture we're in can really dictate how we approach a situation like this. And here's what I mean by that. So uh, I've done a lot of studying and research and written a book about succession. And essentially the, the, the idea that I'm thinking about is when you talk about what are the opportunities in our area, mm -hmm. this is what kind of posture you're in. And so oftentimes we're in a fighting posture. So we, we're, we're protecting what we have. So this is the idea of we're gonna lock all of our, everybody's gonna be in our house. You know, no one's talking to anybody. We're gonna like hunker down, right? So this idea of we're gonna self-protect and we're gonna, we're gonna close all the entry points to this, this, this fortress that we have. And so we're kind of really protecting what we have. The, the, the complete opposite of that is you're, is you're open-handed, right? So you're in a posture where your hands are completely open. And I think right now the, there's a lot of messages that are self-protect, get your, you know, if your fists up, tight, hold on to everything as tightly as you can protect everything around you. And then there's this other message that says there are people that are hurting and there's a community that's hurting. There are people that are um, losing their jobs. Like I said, there are people that are struggling to find the groceries at HEB because there's nothing on the shelves. I mean, there are people that are in dire need of support. And so I think the challenge right now is one is a posture of fear. One is a posture of hope. And so I think that to the degree that we can open our hands, whether that's, um, you know, I mean, you mentioned earlier about just the, the scriptural references about the, the wisdom of, of more than one. And so in the same way, each of us has been given gifts. And so we have different gifts that we can get, that we can offer to people. It could be financial. It could be just encouragement. It could be your time. Uh, it could be hospitality. There, there are all different kinds of spiritual gifts that we have, administration, leadership. And so right now, I think if we can be open-handed with the gifts we have, in terms of the things that we're seeing around us, then I think it'll take some of the focus off the fear. Right. Just a little more hope in how this community can like come together. And I think that's the, that's the beauty of times of challenge is that it gives you a chance to remember how you're uniquely wired. So like what your gifts are, and it doesn't mean that everyone has money to give, everybody has time to give, everybody has an encouragement to give, but if you're wired that way, right? God made you, um, to be part of that equation that way. You're part of that puzzle. And so I think right now that's the area where at least we've been talking about that in our home, the idea of, you know, what can we give? Um, what can we be doing now to, to be grateful for what we do have? Um, the fact that, you know, I'm still employed and we still have a business and things like that, but we don't know. And so right now, what, what, what can we be grateful for and be open-handed with that? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's, I think the thing that's the biggest opportunity is to pull back from a, a fighting posture where we're holding on to things and we're maybe reading the news feed too much um, to, to open our hands a little bit and go, what do I have to offer everyone else? The people that, that are, that could be really in need. I mean, I'm sitting in an office uh, on a computer getting to have a conversation with you and I'm, I'm not worried about some things that there are a lot of people that are worried about that right, right. now. 
and I want to be in a posture of, of being open-handed with what I have um, to be helpful. So I think that's the, that's a big opportunity for the community. So, well, isn't that the, uh, uh, what our, our savior said, uh, you know, reaching out to those who can't help themselves, the, the orphans and the widows, even though you didn't use those, that terminology, there's yeah. people that are in pain, people in need. And, uh, I think that's a good message for our whole community. Uh, in, in the Bible, it talks about, uh, you know, uh, uh, the sign of maturity in the, the body of Christ is uh, each of us giving uh, our talents and time uh, to one to the other, because we all have a different measure of that, which you, you spoke to yeah. very well. Yeah. And so I, I want to affirm that. And so folks, today, uh, we've had a chance to speak uh, with a dear firm, friend of mine, Eric Heyman, uh, the CEO at, of Austin Asset. And, uh, here at Alba, we're glad to bring you these uh, conversations. Uh, we, we hope that you will not only be uh, challenged, but you'll also be encouraged. Uh, let's not, uh, like Eric says, stand back here and fight. Let's open up. Let's use this as an opportunity all across with our churches, with our friends, uh, with uh, our employees to encourage one another. And there's somebody on your team that has a gift, uh, a bit of knowledge, a bit of uh, uh, expertise that uh, needs to come out. So let's make sure that happens today. Thank you again. And thank you, Eric, for being with us. You're welcome. Thanks, Rich.